Hello sociologists, welcome to the next in a series. This is the first lesson on wars and conflicts and basically what I'm going to do is take you through one of the easiest parts of the course, how development and wars and conflict connect. And what I'm going to try and provide you with is evidence and examples that you wouldn't find in the textbook. I will include, uh, and you will have already found, a scan of the relevant chapter, it's only very short, uh, from the textbook uh, attached to the Show My Homework section. And what I hope to do now is take you through in a little bit better detail some of the examples that you can use to illustrate the points that are being made within that um, topic and approach. Uh, wars and conflicts and development and the connection between them. I've called this an effect of development, uh, or rather how development is affected by. You'll see what I mean. So, War and conflict in the developing world is our focus. This is a photograph from the Yemen civil war, which is ongoing. And a good example to use to illustrate a lot of the concepts that I'm going to be talking about as we go through this. So let's start with why we need to know this. Why, in a course about global development and economic development at that, are we busily talking about, um, well, war and conflict? It seems an odd choice. And the answer is simply that much of the world's conflict is in the developing rather than the developed world. It just is. Uh, we can prove that empirically. There's far more um, wars and civil wars in areas that are not economically developed than there are in areas that are economically developed. Uh, for example, Britain is currently split between Remainers and Brexiteers, um, largely, politically, and those two groups don't like each other very much. In the 2019 election, the Brexiteers won. They got a government in place that believed the same things they did and would deliver the Brexit they said they wanted. And even though that's not gone terribly well economically, alongside a global pandemic, we have yet to descend into civil war. Even the USA, with an actual attempt by a president to cause an incitement uh, and incite a coup, it didn't happen. So developing countries seem to have some kind of armour on when it comes to wars and conflict. There is clearly some form of connection. Civil wars are far more common in developing countries than they are in developed countries. Indeed, I don't know of a developed country that has descended into civil war since the beginning of the 21st century. And indeed, during the um, uh, 20th century, I can think of very few. Iran is the nearest I get. And um, they weren't fully developed when they descended into a civil war. So you could argue that civil wars are a feature of less developed countries, and indeed they tend to create further conflict once they've taken place. Actually, I tell a lie, Bosnia-Herzegovina is another example, and I'll come back to that later. Conflict is also related to poverty somehow. Either poorer countries are more susceptible to conflict, or conflict creates situations in which poorer countries are more probable as an outcome. Uh, obviously through, you know, just destruction of material resources, that's going to be an issue. But the question is, which comes first? Does the conflict create the poverty, or the poverty create the conflict? What exactly is the relationship between wars, conflict, destruction, and poverty? We know that countries are poorer. We know that countries are less economically developed. Is conflict a causal factor? Or is it something that comes from the lack of development, and therefore what you need to do to prevent conflict is create development? And the final thing I'm going to talk about is globalisation. And globalisation argues that basically conflicts anywhere on the globe now affect, well, everywhere else on the globe. Britain hasn't had a war, in the old style, more on that later, uh, since 1945. We've had a conflict in the Falklands, but it didn't really materially affect or threaten the British Isles. And we've had wars in places like Korea, but again, they haven't materially affected or threatened the British Isles. And yet, I would argue that Elements such as the 7-7 bombings, um, elements such as the Manchester bombing in 2017, uh, elements such as terrorist attacks still affect us, and therefore conflicts elsewhere in the world and on the globe affect the West, even though the West is not necessarily directly involved in them. And that means we have to talk about it when we're talking about global development, because it does actually affect the way development works in even developed countries. And thus, the question becomes, what is the relationship between conflict and development?
Because there clearly is one. There's clearly connections. How do you use that to explain why countries behave the way they do, why conflicts happen the way they do, what conflicts there are, and how do we apply that with sociology? So that's my intro. Um, oh, it's not working. Thank you. The next one, therefore, is what are the relationships? So let's talk about Duffield. And I don't mean where we are. Duffield? I mean Duffield. This Duffield. Wow. I mean, that's a firm choice in the glasses department being made there. Um, I shouldn't be too harsh. Duffield gets quoted a lot. But in 2001, one of the first studies that Duffield put into the relationship between war and conflict and development, um, in 2001, uh, Duffield argued that in the 1990s, the international community basically got involved in conflict as a humanitarian concern and, and had been doing so since the 1950s and 60s. What does this mean? It means that countries were turning up to look after the victims of conflict. They were providing aid and food and shelter and preventing refugee problems and attempting to stop disease running rampant through destroyed sewer systems. But generally speaking, they weren't really interested in the causes of the conflict themselves, arguing that basically it was none of their business. Their job was to prevent suffering. Toward the end of the 1990s, there was a marked shift. And there are a lot of reasons behind this, but from a sociological perspective, basically, it was recognised that conflict was preventing stability. Now, stability is incredibly important in world trade. If you want to trade with another country, you need to be certain that the same people are in charge of the resources year in, year out, so that any deal you make won't be affected by a sudden change of hands. And that happens a lot in violent conflict. People who own one particular resource may find themselves ousted in terms of political power. If you've been bribing and using corruption to get, I don't know, political kickbacks for a particular nation, you can see why TNCs would be deeply upset if their, I don't know, local contact was replaced by someone else whom they didn't know because of a, I don't know, civil war or a coup. A coup is a seizure of power by a small group. Or, as Duffield put it, development is unlikely without stability. And at the same time, security is not sustainable without development. The less developed a country is, the more likely it is to defend into descend into conflict. And you can't, in a conflict-ridden nation, create the development you need to create security. Why is this? Why, what caused this shift? Well, it's globalisation. If you remember in globalisation, we're talking about economic globalisation and cultural globalisation. Economic globalisation meant things like McDonaldization, where companies had the same practices regardless of where they were in the world. Coca colonization meant that everyone recognised the same brand names and those TNCs became powerful regardless of which country they were in. The brand of Coca-Cola um, is recognised throughout the world. The way in which McDonald's does business is the same wherever they are. This requires a certain element of stability in the countries they enter. Or, as Duffield puts it, underdevelopment has become dangerous. If a country you move into as a business is unstable or in conflict, then you cannot do your same business practices and you cannot get the same profit. This sounds perfectly normal and you're like, well, why are you telling me this? But it's a sociological aspect. It's something you need to be aware of. It's why in the mid to late 1990s, with the advent of globalisation and the power of TNCs, the West changed their focus to try and prevent future conflict, to try and make sure that conflicts were resolved and finished and dealt with. Fighting is bad for business, is basically what it boils down to. So what are these conflicts that we're now trying to deal with in a sociological pattern? And to understand this, we need to understand how wars have changed from old wars to new wars. And Kaldor, um, there she is, by the way, she's the first picture. Uh, Kaldor in 2006 came up that there's been a change. Old wars in the early 20th century, the first half, roughly speaking, versus new wars, which were a feature from the 1960s onwards. So what is an old war and how does it differ from a new war? Well, let's start with this uh, term of total war. Total war is where a state mobilises everything within it. A state is what's there when governments change. I, as a teacher, am an agent of the state. When there's an election and we change a government, I do not change. 
And so elements of the state, things like education, the police forces, the armed forces, the generals, they organise, under the leadership of government, sure, to defend a nation from attack or to attack another nation. An old war, therefore, requires everyone in the country to put themselves on the line. All civilians are at risk of attack in a total war. And in a total war, all elements of the state are mobilised. You cannot win or lose on the battlefield alone. Mere armies will not win you a war. In the First and Second World Wars, the enemy country that lost, lost because of a failure of their entire nation. Not, well, not solely, military failure. That's not what lost in the war. The First World War in particular, Germany lost, but it didn't suffer a crushing military defeat. Rather, it suffered a collapse of the home front the people wouldn't fight on. Uh, Russia too, in 1917, also collapsed under a similar pressure. In the Second World War, um, USSR should have failed because it suffered crippling military defeats. And yet its home front, its ability to function in a total war situation, kept it going. So that's an old war. A new war tends to be more limited. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. The next thing is public versus privatised um, conflict or public versus privatised wars. Public wars are fought with people in uniform and they're fought with weapons owned by the state and they're fought with factories and they're fought with businesses getting behind particular states and selling weapons. The losses are public, uh, the risks are public. You can be raided with air raids and missiles uh, as a worker in London just as easily as you can be a soldier on the front lines in Egypt, for example, in the Second World War. A privatised conflict is very different. A privatised conflict doesn't require factories necessarily, nor does it necessarily require any kind of um, understanding of uniform or um, a differentiation between a soldier and a civilian. In many ways, it relies on that. More on that in a moment, but hopefully you get the concept. Thirdly, old wars offered a socially organised and legitimised violence. Everyone accepts that soldiers have a right to murder, to brutalise, to shoot, to kill. Um, explosions and mutilations and action by armed forces is understood to be legalised and understood to be the right thing to do. Now, I'm not here arguing that wars are not legitimate or that we should all be pacifists. Um, that's a different discussion. I'm not here to talk about the morality of it. I'm here to talk about the sociology of it. And sociologists point out quite rightly, I think, that in situations of international conflict, in old wars, governments essentially waive the usual rules of society for the pr purpose of pr uh, doing that war. A privatised war, or as uh, Keane puts it, and there is... Uh, uh, there, I don't have a picture of Keane. As Keane put it, uh, in 2005, you'll see that I... Uh, sorry, 1995, I'll refer to Keane later again. Um, in formal wars, this is different. That There is no distinction between those carrying out the violence and those who should be protected from it. So, guerrilla war. Guerrilla means small war in Spanish. Um, means that um, people can dress like a civilian or even are civilians and hide weapons on their person. Turn up, whip out a gun, shoot down somebody then hide the gun and run off into the crowd. How do you deal with that? More on that in a moment. Fourthly, old wars are typified by sophisticated technology. In an old war, uh, the state is the one doing the fighting. And that means you can use the latest in jet fighters, and missiles and uh, uh, complicated technology, tanks, for example, in battle. I do not have access to an M1 Abrams main battle tank. I simply don't. I'd love to, by the way. They're available for $1.4 million, or they were in the late 1990s. Um, I can't, therefore, organise my own tank division to go and invade somewhere. States can do that. The M1 tank is a phenomenal piece of kit, and the M1A2 even more phenomenal than that. And it will work against another state that deploys things like, well, I don't know, tanks, like the T90 or the T88. Yes, I am a tank nerd. But... That allows states to fight in a way that you or I can't. I can't pick up a tank and then drive into battle. A new war is based on homemade technology. It's the ability to make your own gunpowder. Um, it's the ability to make your own nuclear weapon. I can do that, by the way. Um, or at least I know the theory. And 
you can do these sorts of things at IEDs, um, improvised explosive devices. And that allows, well, anyone to take part. You don't need the resources of a state to carry out that kind of warfare. Um, Duffield in 1998 referred to them as postmodern wars for that reason. Um, but Caldor in 2006 simply said that sophisticated technology was an, a, a feature of uh, old wars, whereas new wars don't tend to use the same sophisticated technology. Uh, wars in Yemen, wars in uh, Syria, the Syrian civil war, wars in Ukraine, don't tend to use, say, jet fighter aircraft uh, to carry out major attacks because the, the sides don't have access to that technology, nor do they need it. Um, more on that when I talk about new wars. And the fifth aspect of an old war is alliances between nation states. The First and Second World Wars, and indeed the Korean War, uh, were won by alliances. They were not won by one nation fighting another nation. That's not how it worked. Nation states were pretty evenly matched and therefore required friends to, well, keep going. If nation states were isolated, say Nazi Germany, the Third Reich and the Second World War, they tended to lose relatively quickly as a consequence because they couldn't draw on the resources of more than one nation. Basically, it was a resource fight. It didn't matter what the technology was, it was the resources that were able to bring to the table. So, speaking as a military historian, but also a sociologist, wars are won by resources. They're won by impersonal things. Individual heroism has nothing to do with war. However, new wars are typified by disintegration, by multiple fracturings of sides and groups and interested parties so that no one group actually has any kind of monopoly on power. As a consequence, in new wars you tend not to get alliances between nations, rather you get nations falling into disrepair. Um, sure, and there he is uh, in a picture in his attic, I assume, capturing a bit of a mood. Do we say mood? Mood. Um, very much for this uh, remote learning experience. Shaw called them degenerate wars. Oh, you can tell I'm recording in school. Uh, because they revolve around this concept of genocide and ethnic cleansing, rather than revolving around some kind of national ideal. Now, you could argue that the Second World War had an element of genocide within it, and it certainly did. That, that's what typified the Third Reich. But new wars tend to be about the genocide, rather than genocide as a, sort of an extraneous thing. The Nazis didn't start the Second World War to carry out genocide, and the Allies didn't fight the Nazis to stop genocide. Sorry, they didn't. Um, but modern new wars tend to have genocide as the main reasoning behind what they're doing. Uh, Keane, in 1995, uh, went further and argued that these privatised, disintegrating wars um, were almost sparked by genocide um, and the desire to carry it out. So there's your old versus new, which brings me on to the second part of that. So, so what is a new war when it's at home? How do we typify a new war if we can't do it simply by an opposition to the old wars? Because, I mean, you can, you can see how I've set it out there. But that's rather complicated. There must be an easier way. Well, the first way to typify a new war is this idea of identity politics. Uh, Collier, in 2008, pointed this out with the Rwandan conflict of the late 1990s. Rwanda had uh, two major tribal groups, Hutus and Tutsis, and their mutual antagonism spilled over into war when genocide was threatened. And large numbers of people lost their lives. And I'll be honest, I'm, I'm really bad at this. I cannot remember which way around it went, but you can find this if you go looking online or if you go looking on YouTube, you can find some quite harrowing accounts, not, not the actual images themselves, of people who were, well, almost killed during that genocide. There was a genocide. Since then, of course, and since the publication of the textbook in which that appeared in 2011, there have been other wars. Yemen, which is ongoing now, is fought over identity politics. Uh, there's the Houthis, uh, for example, who are trying to take, the rebel Houthis, I think they are, trying to take power and who have been stymied by the, ba the rebels backed by uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia instead. In the Syrian civil war, there were Muslims, there were Christians, there were um, less... ISIS influenced Muslims, there was in fact ISIS, um, there was a whole host of different groups, all of whom identified with a, a core identity, a, something beyond being Syrian. They were all Syrian, but they had something else that kept them going. 
Uh, another example would be Bosnia-Herzegovina in the 1990s, and you had Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian um, or Serbo Croats, you had um, Bosnian Muslims, and Bosnian Christians, all of whom ended up fighting a lot because of their varying identities. And this kept the war going beyond the usual point a war would be fought because, well, I don't know about yourselves, identity is something we hold quite close to ourselves. So identity politics, this idea of identifying with a particular way of viewing yourself, can keep these new wars going beyond the point that old wars would have finished. The second way you can differentiate is the type of warfare, the modes of warfare. Caldor in 2006 pointed out that increasingly uh, non-state players, i.e. people that did not control an entire nation, were resorting to terrorism to carry out their attacks. They were resorting to guerrilla warfare, blurring the distinction between civilians and soldiers. And you can see this with multiple examples. Uh, the rise of ISIS, Islamic State, um, was down to, well, that. The, the mode of warfare was guerrilla war. It was terrorism. It was striking fear into their enemy. People say, oh, they want to wipe us out. No, they don't. What terror works as is, well, it's in the name. It wants to inspire terror so that people don't oppose it. And this use of terror means you've got to hide in the civilian population. How else do you make yourself unpredictable and frightening? Of course they've got to look like everybody else. Of course they're not going to have the uniforms. Of course they're going to resort to bombs and suicide bombings. How do you stop a suicide bombing? Of course you're going to carry out atrocities. It's not about killing large numbers of people. It's about proving you can kill some. Um, Afghanistan is another good example of that. Afghanistan was ruled rather peacefully, not necessarily nicely, by the Taliban. And they didn't really export terrorism. Rather, one person went to ground there, and he happened to be involved in a sort of anarchist enclave uh, that had effectively carried out a terrorist attack on US soil. Yes, I'm talking about Al Qaeda, I'm talking about Osama bin Laden, I mean Osama bin Laden, who turned out to have been hiding in Afghanistan. He's actually a Saudi national and had actually planned the attacks on US soil from Pakistan, but that didn't matter. He had a base in a terrorist training camp that had been set up by the United States to fight the Soviets in the 1980s in Afghanistan. Therefore, Afghanistan was blamed. The ruling junta, uh, the Taliban, a very, very Muslim sect, um, I say even very Muslim, particular interpretation of Muslim, Muslim extremists, I suppose you might call them nowadays. Um, and they had set up their own state, which was pretty awful. And that was used in confluence with this idea that um, Afga Afghanistan had, had had this terrorist training camp to justify an invasion. And the West went in and tried to bomb them out. Well, that didn't work terribly well. The Taliban turned out to be quite good at stopping drugs production and quite good at stopping potential terrorists going to other countries and carrying out atrocities, which is why Osama bin Laden had planned the attack on the Twin Towers from Pakistan, which was less good at controlling that. When the West went in to fight there, they, in essence, removed those controls and made it more likely that there would be terrorist attacks elsewhere in the world. Uh, over time, the military intervention was able to clamp down on that, but it, it sort of squeezed it into neighboring countries. But you see the problem. Um, in Myanmar, at the moment, uh, the, the fate of the Ouija's there is rather down to the way the army is carrying out its genocide. Its mode of warfare is indistinguishable from police action, which is in turn indistinguishable from, well, genocide. It's really difficult to tell who the combatants are. Um, I mentioned the Syrian civil war again. Um, same point as before. How could you tell which groups they were? The Free Syrian Army, the ISIS state, uh, those loyalists to the um, Bashir, they were all the same uniform. How could you tell the difference? How did they know the difference? It became impossible. Thirdly, these wars tend to continue far beyond their usual uh, 
survivability uh, because they're funded from outside the country. It doesn't matter how much destruction is wrought within the country because they've got globalised financing by refugees from the conflict who go and live somewhere else and send money and resources back to those fighters who are fighting for their side in the hope that they can return home soon. Or perhaps it's by other groups like TNCs funding warlords because they hold a particular resource that those TNCs want access to. Or maybe it's blood diamonds, for example, in the De Beers Corporation. Or maybe it's oil in Libya. Or maybe it's um, in 2011. Or maybe it's, I don't know, um, chromium and, what's the word, lithium in, uh, Bol uh, not Bosnia, sorry, ah, Bolivia. There we go. Maybe it's something like that. So they create shadow economies. Now, the best example of this that I have, there's one in the textbook, and you'll be able to read that for yourselves with the uh, attached textbook extract. But the best example I have of that is the rebels in the Libyan civil war. They went against Colonel Gaddafi, who was then the ruler of Libya, and they took control of Benghazi. Benghazi was not the capital of Libya, but it was the main port through which Libya exported oil. And it turned out that the USA and the EU both wanted access to Libyan oil because it was cheaper than buying it from places like Saudi Arabia and also closer and less susceptible to interception along the way. By seizing Benghazi, the rebels were able to essentially create a shadow economy. They were able to sell that oil and use the money they got for selling the oil to buy military equipment to prosecute the war against the then legitimate government of Libya. And that's why they won. They were able to basically outbid the Libyan government on the supply of oil to those that mattered. These shadow economies, therefore, can be quite powerful in reshaping developing countries and how they work, and are largely the result of realpolitik, it will be called, pragmatic decisions to maintain supply of a particular resource the West wants. That's one element of globalised financing. The other one is the Tamil Tigers in the civil war in Sri Lanka, now over as of 2016, uh, with an awful act of genocide on the Tamils. But the Tamil Tigers, who were fighting against those uh, forces, were funded by mainly Tamils living in Canada and the EU, who had fled from potential genocide, got jobs and sent extra money through the internet to the Tamil Tigers to keep them going and, and to provide them with arms and weapons and financing. How does any nation prevent, it's a lot of buzzing, how does any nation prevent uh, that kind of financing in their own country from maintaining a civil war? And the answer is you can't. So they keep going until the bitter end. The final point I want to make uh, is globalised culture. Many warlords and people who set themselves up in civil wars do so through the cult of the West, i.e. they identify with obvious examples of wealth. And if you remember from modernization theory, um, the idea is that you can get these symbols and use them on mass media to get people to understand why development is necessary. So uh, brand names like uh, Rolex and Mercedes and Rolls-Royce can be used because everyone understands those brands. If you get a warlord who's able to show off those brands, they're going to get recruits of people who want to be like them. So Taylor, for example, Charles Taylor in, uh, where was he? Uh, was it Zia? Um, in Sierra Leone, created his own nation, Taylorland, um, and basically wore a Rolex, had an obvious mobile phone in the 1990s, which was a big deal, and um, showed off his Mercedes. Loads of people believed, therefore, he was successful and going to achieve his aims, and therefore were easily recruited by his regime. Uh, he failed, he was beaten, but the point is, he had an army. They came from somewhere, they were volunteers, and they saw his obvious wealth based on Western symbolism, and wanted that for themselves. And anyone who wants to set themselves up in a developing nation that's stricken with poverty can do so by using obvious symbols of wealth to prove that whatever it is they're selling and whatever it is they say they're fighting for is the right thing to do. So that's what a new war looks like. It appeals to different things. There's, there's no need to appeal to patriotism or to the higher order uh, thought patterns that you might associate with warfare, but rather with personal greed and ambition. What's the point of all of this? Well, all of these points make new wars much harder to end. How do you satisfy these problems in a traditional way? And the answer is you kind of can't. 
they're always going to have these people fighting. And as a consequence, because they're harder to end, the issues that cause these wars and keep them going are harder to solve. New wars are not like old wars. You can't just finish them by having a defeated enemy sign a treaty. It won't work. Their supporters are unlikely to put down and give up their arms or their cause. Something like ISIS may be rooted out and destroyed, but the idea behind that death cult, and it was a death cult, I'll come into that more later, um, the idea behind that death cult remains. People who are susceptible to that concept remain. And that's where terrorism comes from. How do you beat terrorism? And the answer is, you can't, at least not easily. But I'm aware of time. I'm getting close to half an hour. So that's probably enough to be going on with for now. I've got another lesson of this, part two, will come up uh, next week on Monday. And hopefully the notes are making a little bit more sense. I'm, I'm experimenting with uh, format, if you will. If this has worked, that's brilliant. If it hasn't, for whatever reason, please let me know in the show my homework. Uh, I'm trying to make sure this makes sense. I do believe it to be one of the easiest topics. We've got one more lesson on it, and then I'll do a 20 marker next Wednesday um, on wars and conflict. You'll find it relatively easy, I think. Um, and then that's it. We're done. Um, so hopefully, if you have been, thank you for watching, and it's been useful to you, hopefully. And have a lovely rest of day. And I shall see you in the next video next week. Bye-bye now.